This is Dance Studio 411, where we answer your real life questions about your toughest studio life predicaments parent problems, teacher turnover, student challenges, policy dilemmas, and so much more. Let's talk about what's keeping you awake at night and what you can do about it. Here are your hosts, Suzanne Blake Garrity and Jill Tyrone. Welcome to this episode of our Dance Studio 411 podcast. And today, Jill and I are digging into how to be a great dance boss, all the leadership and management that comes with running a dance studio, right, Jill? Yeah, it's such an important topic, Suzanne. You know, we ask a lot of studio owners, you know, what's their biggest challenge with running a studio? And at the top of the list often comes, there's so much to do, I don't know what to do first, and I ought to just do it all myself because delegating is impossible and, you know, I'll just get it done. And I think it's easy to want to take control of everything, right? As the, as the owner and the dance boss, you're like, I've got this. I am the cleaning lady. I am the bookkeeper. I am the recital planner, and I am the to-doer of all the things, but that's a recipe for disaster, right, Joe? Oh gosh, such a recipe for disaster, but so easy to get caught up in that. It is so easy to go to that place in our head that says, hey, we can do this faster. We can do it better. We can do it more. It's not more efficient, but just, you know, we can get it done. And boy, that just leads to disaster for sure. Exactly. Because that's that old conundrum of being a business owner, which is I don't have enough money or time or resourcing to outsource it. So I'll just do it myself, but it creates this cycle. And so, you know, in this episode, we're kind of going at our top tips for how we've watched our own business grow and how we've helped other studio owners and how we know, you know, you really have to take these tips to heart as being a great dance boss because there will always be more to do. It's never going to get like easier. It's going to continue to get more intense. And so keeping these tips we're about to share at, you know, in front of mind as you plan ahead will really help you. So I think the first thing, Jill, is that that gets right into, you know, do you really know how much your time is worth as an owner? Because, you know, most, many of you guys are working for free. You're not taking a paycheck. So you have no idea what your time is worth. So you have a great tip on this. Yeah. It's so easy to get caught up in that cycle of just doing more and more and more. And before you know it, you're working, you know, more than 40 hours a week, maybe 70, even 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And one of the things that we worked on this summer when we were doing some of our, our seminars is actually figuring out what your time is worth. So there's a quick formula I'd love to go over. And it basically shows you based on an average salaried employee. So we all know that we're not because we flex our hours. We tend to work more than this, but we'll just give a good guideline. So based on the average of a salaried employee working 40 hours a week times 52 weeks a year. So we'll, we'll just average that out. It comes out to 2,080 hours. So 2,080. And to, de to determine an hourly wage based on this, you divide your annual salary by that 2,080 hours. So now we can kind of insert a little joke here about, yeah, well, what annual right. salary, right? Um, so let's pretend, or if you are taking your annual sal salary, use what you're drawing or what you hope to draw out of your business, right? So if you make $75,000 a year, or that's your goal, or that's what you'd like to bring home and take out of the business, you divide that 75,000 by 2,080. That's that, the calculation of the hours, 40 hours by 52 weeks. And that comes out to $36.06. So right about $36, that would be your hourly wage if you were drawing $75,000 a year and working, um, like a full, work, like a full working that full 40, yeah. 40 hours a week. Exactly. And then if we wanted to do it with 50, so $50,000 divided by the 2080 hourly wage is 2403. So right about $24. And then uh, dropping down one more bracket, $35,000 divided by 2080, the hourly wage is $16 and 82 cents. So you can see if you're, if you know, you're working 50 hours, take 50 hours times 52 weeks a year and divide that into what you're either drawing or what you'd hope to draw. And you're going to see some significant numbers. So play around with that, but that's a good place to start. 
is to literally figure out how much your time is worth. Because Suzanne, I'm going to turn this back to you then. You have a great tip. If you know what your hourly wage is or you know what you're worth, then it becomes very easy to say, yes, I'm going to delegate this out at X amount of dollars per hour to somebody that knows what they're doing. Yeah. So if you find out, I mean, some, some studio owners, they are eyes open wide and they're like, wow, I'm making $4 an hour on average. Yeah. And that's, that's a hard pill to swallow, but we were, we are here to help you move that number up. But also if you can outsource a task for less than your hourly wage, you should do that. So that comes to mind things like cleaning, uh, filing papers, organizing closets. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things that you're doing that could be either outsourced at a very low rate um, or, or done more efficiently from a, even an automated resource that costs less than an hourly wage. I mean, sometimes we overstep that some things can be automated. Oh, definitely. Or even some things at home. So you're mentioning about cleaning, but even not so much for the studio, maybe it's time to get somebody to help you clean at home or order groceries in and pay that little bit of an extra fee to do that. Those are also time saving and kind of energy saving tools as well. Once you realize that it might be worth the, the payoff with what you're making versus what you would pay out for that service. Exactly. So our first tip of being a great dance boss, a empowered leader and manager of your studios, you've got to know what your time is worth and what your value is. Absolutely. I think it's, yeah, that's the perfect place to start for this, this podcast for sure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once you know what that's worth at your time, let's talk about, there is the multitude of projects we have in motion as a studio owner. And I think that back to our, our love of control, because we're mm -hmm. great at what we do. Don't mistake that. You're great at what you do, but doing it all, again, is too much. So we get stuck in the 87 post-it notes, 27 lists, things digitally, things not. So your next tip helps us get organized as a dance boss. Yeah, Suzanne, this, this next step is really part of, you know, it comes from our members right in our, in our Facebook group. Uh, we had one member that reached out to me. She was totally overwhelmed because she had so many balls in the air, so many tasks to remember, so many projects to manage. And she's like, Jill, how do I get it all done? And the best tip I have for this is to use one or two at the most, but use one tool that works for you and just keep using it. Um, for instance, if it's project management, you can definitely use that, but have everything live in there so that you know exactly where all those little post-it notes, right? To mark those down as little tasks or little cards or little lists and put those right in one spot so that as you go through your day and then you go back in, in a week or two and or at the end of the month, you know exactly where those little tips live or those ideas or those things that you definitely need to remember. So it doesn't really matter what tool. We don't have one that we really recommend. We like some of the free tools that work really well. Trello, ClickUp is newer and I love it. I've been using that recently, but there's so many different tools on the market, but don't get caught up in getting, oh, I need an app for that. I need another app for that. Find one that you really love and use it. I use, I use one project management or try to with everything. And then I have a, a, a just a regular old notebook that mm -hmm. I kind of brain dump and I write all my stuff out and then I'm able to go in and put that in and set some deadlines and tasks too. So it doesn't really matter what the project management is or the tool. There's, there's all the different listing tools that you can make a list and all the tasks that go along with your list, but just use it. Think of it as your boss. I heard somebody give this great tip. You wouldn't go to work and sit down at your desk if you had a job like that and not check in with your boss and see what's on the list for today. What are we doing? You would always check in so your project management becomes your boss. Check in with that project management once, twice, three times a day and make sure that you're using it. Exactly, and it, we, we sometimes, you know, we get ambitious in our to-do list. We think, oh, I'm going to get these 27 things done today. And then we feel like an epic failure yeah. at the end of the day because we haven't achieved all of those. And I think that's at expectations, which is kind of your third point, mm -hmm. which is that we have a lot to do. And now we know, we know what our time, we have to figure out what our time's worth. Then we have right. a place to put the to-dos, mm -hmm. but then it's like all the like, fires and the urgent things come. So your third tip is really about your setting boundaries on your time, right? You, you have to set the boundaries as your, as your own boss, you have to set boundaries. 
turn off all of the ding dongs, the alarms, the clicks, the bells, the whistles, the fire <laughs> alarms, <laughs> everything, turn them off and silence things. And I know you're saying, okay, Jill, how on earth can I do this? When I go into the studio and the toilet is clogged, I have a parent that really needs me. I have a student that's sick, whatever it may be. These are more for times when you're actually not at the studio. So set aside time if you go to a coffee shop, if you're able to work from home, whatever it may be, but turn everything off and set those boundaries and say, no, I'm, the email doesn't run me. I decide when I'm checking into email. I decide when I'm checking into Messenger. I decide when I'm going to be doing uh, these certain things. So that's a really good way to do it. And you can set aside a very small chunk of time, right? Set aside one hour turn off everything and then chunk something that you want to do. Maybe it's working on a schedule for the, or your recital show order or anything that needs a good batch of time, write it down and then just sit down and get it done. It's really, exactly. like, it's, that's as simple as that. Just get it done. Exactly. When I, we were just working with some studio owners in an it, 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 in-person event and, we, and I reiterated mm -hmm. to them that time management is a myth. It is really energy management. You yeah. have to you have to be the one that says, this is what I'm working on today. And I, I mean, if, if anybody knows what it feels like to have two uninterrupted hours to get things done, you can get an amazing amount of work done in that time. So it's like focus deep and get it done. And you're the one that's got to set the boundaries. Not no one else. Everyone else will find you if you let them find you. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. They will find you. And going back to what you said, Suzanne, too, about like, try not to make a list of 24 things. I found a good method that works for me is in the morning, I set out um, like three priorities. What are the three things my must do's or my one thing, even if it's just one, what's my one thing to get done in that one hour that I do have today? and just do it. And that way you don't feel so overwhelmed by the 27 other things. And for sure, shut off that big list of 27 other items when you're working on your one big thing or those top three things that you have to get done in the day. Exactly. And that's what even at our own studio, we try to look ahead into the week and say, at the end of the week, what has to happen for us to feel like this was a successful week? And then everything else has to not be as much of a priority as you know, cause at the studio, it feels like a cycle of the, you know, the week of class, right? It's like, it's a, for some of you, it's the Monday to Saturday. Some of you, it's the Monday to Sunday or wh however your week in your brain focuses, you know, what's the one thing that has to happen this week for you to feel like this week was a success and everything else gets shut off until that happens. So good tip. So. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Um, which actually kind of leads into, you know, being a great dance boss and being a great leader and manager of your studio is the going back to embracing the beginner mind all the time. Um, you and I teach on this often, Jill. Mm -hmm. It's something we love as innately teachers ourselves. Um, that the world we're living in as studio owners and, and business owners is constantly changing. And sometimes we'll have people come up to us and say, well, I'm a veteran studio owner. So, you know, I don't need that. And then we're like, mm, no, everybody needs to be taking what you like. A, you like to do a certain thing every day. You have a best practice on this beginner mind method. I love to get up and read for, even if it's just 15 minutes in the morning, I don't take hours to do it for sure. And I did it this morning. I picked up a different book because I said, oh, I, I really just need a different mindset. I really want to switch gears here. Picked up a different book and I read, uh, I think it was two chapters this morning. They were fairly quick. It was done in 15 minutes and I take just time for myself, quiet time in the morning. And it sets my whole day off on a really good, good note because I learned something and it's always important. We're so giving and we give so much of our time and we teach, whether we're teaching our staff or we're teaching our own classes and those kiddos, we have to be able to nurture and nourish our own selves so that we can give more to others. Exactly. So always be learning is the mantra of the beginner's mind. And I love that. And I think that that's the business owner in today's day and age that has an advantage over the rest. So power to you guys listening to this podcast, because we know you're an, a lifelong learner. So keep it up. Absolutely. Um, and then I like this next one, or if we're ready to go into this one, Suzanne, mm -hmm. this is something that you do. And I think it's so great. So talk about this next little point that we have about how you like to wrap up your week or start your week. Exactly. So one of the pitfalls of running a dance studio 
and or being, you know, someone in the creative process is that there's a lot of undone things. We're, we're constantly a, with a project in motion that doesn't feel done, whether it's a recital, a show, choreography, the season we're in. And so our subconscious gets really fatigued by this open loop. And so every Monday, you, you might find a different day that when you feel like your week is ending or starting, I like a Monday morning, is I write down these 10 wins, 10 wins or completions, things that happened that are completed. And actually writing them down allows your subconscious to process it as a completion, even if it's something in the middle of the open loop. So uh, for example, maybe you placed a costume order this week, or you sent an email about your you know, in studio happenings, or you had dinner with your family. Sometimes for me, as I sat and watched my daughter's, you know, game on the weekend, it's, it depends on what it is for you, but it's really key to take a day, a weekly practice to write down these 10 completed things. Because a lot of times what happens, Jill, when we consult with studio owners, they come to us at the end of the recital and they feel empty and burnt out and completely exhausted because they're like, well, was that it? And we're like, if you're only celebrating the completions and the wins on the very big event, you will miss all of the amazing accomplishments that you've had throughout the time it took to get there. So habit of mine, it's a good one as being a leader and a manager and help your team do this. Like invite your staff to celebrate some of this before you do, you know, meetings and such. Yeah, definitely. And I love the way that you, even if you're not complete on something, speaking of it as it is completed or, or will be completed is a great tip. I like to do, I do one or two or even sometimes three, depending on where I, where I am. And I specifically say, you know, I am X, Y, and Z, you know, I am a good leader today. I am a good mom or a great mom or an exceptional leader, exceptional mom. Use that language. And even if you're not quite in that mindset, like we all have days where you're not quite there, but that is very important to just kind of trick yourself Absolutely. into being there. And it really gets you to that next level. Absolutely. Yeah. So now the next one we're going to talk about, you know, being a dance boss and your leader, your leadership skills sometimes are really, they're, they're, what do they call it? Trial under fire. You become mm -hmm. great at managing an upset customer because you are thrown in the middle of having to do it. Yeah. However, I think sometimes as studio owners, we think we have to be great at everything. You know, we have to be hard on, collect, collect those funds, collect that unpaid tuition and be really hard, you know, not let anybody get through the cracks and, or we have to be really like all these things, but mm -hmm. actually the, that's the, also a recipe for disaster as a leader. So we really encourage you to get to know your top three unique skills, the traits that you do best that are your very strong suit. And so there's a bunch of these things you can go online. We have a few favorites. Um, one of the first ones, it's free, uh, 16 personalities, like the number 1616 personalities.com. It's a free test. It's the Myers-Briggs analysis. I think it gives you like these mm -hmm. cute images back of your personality. And um, Jill, you've, do you, have you ever a couple that you like? Yeah. So I, I love the 16 personalities. I actually have my, what I end up with, like what, where I rank, I have it right behind me. And I look at that pretty much daily. So I'm, I'm reminded of it, but we also, you and I both have done the Colby. It's mm -hmm. K-O-L-B-E. Um, that's a good one. I haven't, I haven't looked at that one in a couple of years, but when we both have taken it, it was very interesting because your numbers and my numbers line up and you can exactly see how my weak spots are your strong suits and vice versa. So that's why we have worked so well together all these years. Exactly. So the Colby, it's the Colby A index. You can Google it. It's quite, it's about a $50 online test. It's mm -hmm. amazing in terms of yourself or your team. You know, a lot of the coaching we do with student owners are like, my office manager just doesn't do X, Y, Z, or you get frustrated by this one person. And suddenly when you have you and your team do this, you're like, oh, okay, I'd be better off to be the one to start the email and then have someone on my team edit the email mm -hmm. because they're better at the finishing part and I'm better at the starting. So these are the things, right? Yeah. And that's what, once your eyes are open to that, it, it really gives you a, a lot of insight on where you can focus your energy and have your faculty and staff rise on what they excel in rather than trying to get them to fit into something that they're really just in, innately not good at. 
Exactly. Like, and I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a firm believer that you can train certain skills, but there's other innate traits that are, are, are the, they're just going to lead the way first. So mm-hmm. it's not to say that people can't change. It's just that if someone is great with people, don't put them behind a desk crunching numbers. They should be out with people, you know, let reverse that. If someone yeah. is just like, I am not good with people. It's not my strength. I'm so good at managing spreadsheets. I love to put things in alphabetical order. Then they should be doing those tasks. Let's try to line the talent with the task, line the talent with the task. It's a beautiful thing. And when you get a breakthrough on this as a business owner, your efficiency levels go sky high and the money you're spending on people doing things gets way more, um, you know, effective. So absolutely. So yeah. And if you have a favorite um, personality test or indicator of your skills, let us know. But those are, those are the top two that we really recommend and have used ourselves very well. Yeah. I think the last one is strength finder. You can Google that one. They have one of those for kids too. So, you know, if you have teenagers at home and you want to have them do it, so yeah, check it out. And I mean, lastly, Jill, as this episode, you know, again, the focus is on you're the boss, right? Like you're the one who lives and breathes this business. It literally is you. And so what we notice about some of our members and our studio owners become contractors, they're like, I wish, wish the other people on my team would take the business as serious as, as I do, or why aren't they working so hard? Don't they see why or how the bills get paid? I think you and I both know you have to be your biggest fan and your best mm-hmm. cheerleader. Yeah. And you'll be lucky enough to definitely find people who take your business as seriously as you do. I've, I've had people work with me and for me that have definitely done that. And I've had the other end of the spectrum too, where they really just come to work and they don't care. Um, it's, it's where you have to dig deep and you have to wake up every day, living your mission statement, motivating people. Um, it's, it's a really good thing to just get into that mindset of nobody's going to do your business like you would do because it's you. You have to tell them where you are in your mindset, where you, your expectations are. And as soon as you do that, that actually gives them something to work with. So if you set the expectations and you let them know exactly where they need to be, when they need to be there and what they ha- need to have to, to be prepared to do that, then they'll rise to the occasion. But if you're exactly. just ex- assuming that they're going to come in prepared, you know, let's, let's not go there. Cause that's going to help. That's going to put you on a spiral of you know, down, downfall for, for everybody. Right. And you've done great, great trainings on this. We have past podcasts, but mm-hmm. when you genuinely embody the why behind this business and you share it confidently and proudly with your team, they will see why you're working so hard and they will get behind mm-hmm. that. And so that's going to come through. And so I think if there's anything that we want this episode to reinforce is that y- you're the asset to the business. And when you work on you and you invest in you and you become, you know, that open-minded ongoing leader and leverage your strengths and know what you're worth. Oh my gosh, you're unstoppable. It's just, there's no, there's no two ways about it. And it can cross over into you helping your team do the same. And then that's when, like you said, when, when you're, when you leverage each other's strengths, right? Yeah. That's when the magic happens. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great recipe. You put all those ingredients in and look at what you can create with that. I love that. Exactly. Well, you know, there's a, probably a longer list. So we love to hear from our, we love to hear from our listeners. I mean, if you guys, you're listening to this podcast, if you have, you know, other tips or future episodes you want, you know, reach out to us here, right, Jill, where do they go? Yeah, definitely. So if you go to dancestudio411.com, you'll see all of our episodes there. And there is a form right on the homepage that says to submit your ideas to us. And that's how you can contact us. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks guys. Until our next episode, keeping the amazing dance boss that we know you are. And um, yeah, thanks for all you do for dance. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dance Studio 411. Visit us online at dancestudio411.com for more great resources and to submit a question for a future episode. Our number one goal is to help you build a successful dance studio business and keep your passion for dance alive.